Um, it's a real pleasure to um, welcome Dr Maura Kenny to the stage to present to us today. Um, she's going to be talking about mindfulness, which is a really contemporary and, and uh, I think hot topic nowadays in our work and certainly in the last um, couple of years and particularly the last 12 months we've seen a real trend towards mindfulness and a lot more activity in terms of um, taking that approach and working with clients. So Dr Maura Kenny is based at the Centre for the Treatment of Anxiety and Depression in the Adelaide Health Service. Maura is a psychiatrist specialising in CBT and MBCT for affective and anxiety disorders. She has an extensive experience in running trainings in CBT and MBCT for psychiatry and clinical psychology trainees, GPs, mental health teams and other professionals. She coordinates research programs and has published in the area of MBCT for depression, anxiety and workplace stress. She's led and or organised a number of residential training intensives in mindfulness-based approaches locally, interstate and overseas and she has strong professional links with the Bangor and Oxford Centres for Mind Mindfulness. Please uh, join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. And the laptop's working now? It's not working now. I've been lulled into false sense of security by being able to see the slide here. <laughs> All right. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to talk about mindfulness. Um, I've just been getting an update from some of the staff about what you guys are doing out there in the field, and um, I gather there's quite a bit of interest in mindfulness. Could I just have a show of hands if you've heard of mindfulness? Lots of people. And not just from that slide up there. <laughs> Can I get a show of hands if you use mindfulness with your clients? A few people. Great. And can I have a show of hands if you have your own personal mindfulness or meditation practice? A few people. Wonderful. Very crucial for looking after yourself, particularly in this work, as we'll talk about. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the therapeutic um, benefits of mindfulness, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about the research we're doing in this field as well. Um, it's interesting how these things happen, how I just started collecting some pre and post depression inventories in my first few groups, really just because I wanted to make sure I wasn't doing any harm. It was a new intervention at the time, and I wanted to try and use it with people who were still um, actively symptomatic, who hadn't responded to other um, treatments. And it seemed to me that mindfulness could help, but it's always important when you're trying something new to evaluate it and just to make sure that it is helping and more importantly, isn't making things worse. So I did that and I spoke to my mentors in the UK and they thought I should publish it. And that was some years ago. And now I'm in this rather amazing position, not quite sure how I got here, of um, heading up a mindfulness research group that's affiliated with the University of Adelaide Department of Psychiatry. And these are just some of the things we're looking at as, as we start to roll out different mindfulness projects in the field and see whether they're helpful for people. So we've been looking at not just whether it does help, because we know it does help in some um, conditions and some situations, but we're all in also interested in knowing how it's helping. So I'll talk a bit about that shortly. Interested in its effects on chronic pain. Some of my colleagues are working in the pain unit at the Royal Adelaide um, in psychosis. I've got a colleague who's interested in using it in people with chronic psychosis who are on medication, so it's not a treatment for the acute situation, but for people who are continuing to be distressed by the content of their delusions or hallucinations. And we're looking at it with another group of colleagues at Women's and Children's who are using it for women who are at risk of postnatal depression. I will talk a bit today about its use in the workplace because unless we know how to look after ourselves, it's pretty difficult to look after other people and you've probably figured that out by now. Um, so we're interested to, um, we've actually been collecting some data on that, so I'll tell you about that soon. Um, the Mindfulness in Schools project is something I'm enormously excited about because we're often seeing people, and I'm sure you're in the same position, where you feel a bit like you're the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could teach these skills in schools so that children actually might have some strategies they can use when they're stressed? 
So we've got a project going with the school in Adelaide um, and we're going to try and get a research project going with them. They've already been trialling it and they've done some training with me. And finally, um, we've been looking at its use in chronic medical conditions. I was having a really interesting talk with Janice at Morning Tea about the fact that, um, you know, although people might come into hospital to deal with their mental health issues, um, you've probably realised that your brain and your head is connected to a body, and things go wrong with the body as well. And in fact, they're more likely to go wrong with the body if you've got um, depression or if you've got chronic, serious psychotic illnesses that just does increase the risk, partly because there's maybe some processes that predispose people to both physical and mental health problems, but also because when people are very ill for a long time with psychosis, they start to neglect their health and can run into serious and long-term chronic problems. So we've been interested to see, in a collaboration with the Department of Cardiology at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, whether we can put something in that might be preventive. So that's some of the research we're doing, but just taking ourselves right back and asking the question, what is mindfulness? Because we hear this term bandied around so much now, that, um, and it's increasingly clear to me that people have different ideas about what mindfulness is and what the practice involves. So I'm going to talk about it from the perspective of its use in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, and group programs have grown up um, around using it um, for stress and pain and long-term mental health issues. So really, it's a way of being aware, and particularly of being aware of the present moment, of this moment right now. A lot of the time, if you start to notice what's going on in your mind, you're either planning the future, you're wondering perhaps what's for lunch or whether there'll be any more of those yummy scones left or um, Christmas, eek, is coming up. Um, and we can move into all that kind of going forward in our minds planning. Or we might be thinking about the past, we might be thinking about what's happened this morning or what happened last night or what happened before you got here or what happened five years ago. But oftentimes, when we pay attention to what's going on in our minds, we're not actually here in this present moment right now. And yet, that's the only moment where we can really operate from. You know, we can't time travel. This is where we do things, act, think, respond to people. So it's important, first of all, just to be more aware, less on automatic pilot. But importantly, it's also a way of being with our experience. There's a certain attitude that we're cultivating to our present moment experience, and that's one of gentleness, um, interest, curiosity as to what's going on, and even doing our best to work towards a non-judgmental acceptance of what's happening. Importantly, I think, it's... Um, Good to point out that it's not, although it's often used this way, a technique to get rid of unpleasant mind and body states or difficult emotions. It's really about a radical acceptance of what's going on right now. And from that, we can cultivate tolerance, equanimity, the capacity to be steady with what's happening. As soon as we get caught in this trap of wanting our experience to be other than it is, then we run into problems. We often hear about people um, wanting a quick mindfulness technique that will make their panic or their pain go away. Well, as soon as you want it to go away, what's going to happen to it? You know, it's just going to um, get magnified in your mind, coupled with the frustration of the fact that it's not going away. It's also a practice. Mindfulness practice is a particular kind of meditation practice, which I'm going to lead you through a short one shortly. To, um, to bring our attention deliberately to what's happening in the present moment with those attitudes. And it's also an outcome. When we're practicing like this, then we, the outcome is likely to be that we may become a bit steadier and calmer day to day with lots and lots and lots of practice. So it's not an instant fix by any means. So probably the best way to bring this alive for you, I think, um, and particularly if you're new to it, is just to have a very short little practice now so you get a taste of it. Let me just say that this is entirely voluntary. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. But if you're not going to take part, then maybe just sit quietly and, um, and not disturb other people who, who want to practice in this way. Now, I um, don't know where the microphone's gone, but that's right. 
upstairs. Yep, can you hear me okay? So what I might do is just sit down here. And what I'm going to invite you to do is um, to put down any books and papers you might have on your lap and um, sit in the chair upright with a nice steady kind of dignified posture with both feet on the floor. So uncrossing your legs and having both feet on the floor. It doesn't matter whether you can see me because I'm going to invite you to, if you're comfortable with it, gently closing your eyes or otherwise just allowing your gaze to fall softly on the floor ahead of you or somewhere ahead of you. And bring your awareness now into your body. So really becoming interested in what's happening in your body right now. Feeling the connection your feet are making with the floor. So exploring those sensations of touch. Coming up through your legs and feeling the places your legs, your sit bones are making contact with the chair. Really noticing that. Coming up through the spine, maybe lifting through the spine just a little, not in a hard or you know, tense kind of way, but just with a sense of dignity and ease, allowing your shoulders to drop. Feeling your head and neck evenly poised above your shoulders. Becoming aware of the touch of your hands. Just noticing whether they're touching one another or your lap. Maybe feeling the sensation of skin on skin or the sensation of clothing against the skin of the hands. Just knowing that in this moment you're giving yourself the gift of not having to do anything at all except just be here. And then inviting you now to become aware of your breathing, but not needing to change your breathing in any way, not needing to slow it down or deepen it or make anything happen, but just using it as something to hold your attention moment to moment becoming curious about this business of breathing in. And the sensations in the body as you breathe out. Perhaps being aware of the movement of the rib cage. Or you may be noticing the sensations of the breath at the nostrils. The sensation of the air coming in through the nose, leaving through the nose or mouth. Or you may be aware of the sensations of breathing down in the abdomen. Just feeling that movement of the abdominal wall in and out as you breathe. And you may also have noticed that your mind is still doing its thing. It's still generating thoughts, ideas, images, memories, plans. So not needing to fight with all that thinking but just noticing mindfully that it's here and then gently and without judgment bringing your attention back to your breathing over and over again every time you notice that your mind has wandered away somewhere. Just this breath coming in. Just this breath going out.
And then perhaps expanding the sense of breathing to include a sense of the whole body breathing, sitting here, breathing. And in a few moments, we'll bring this short practice to a close. So just becoming aware that you're here in this room with other people around about you, and very gently and in your own time, opening your eyes. So, if we were in a mindfulness class, I would now be really interested in your experience. I mean, I am interested in your experience, but if we were in a mindfulness class, there would be time to talk about it, what you noticed, what you felt, whether you liked it, whether you didn't, whether it was peaceful, whether it was agitating, whether it was boring. Um, there's all sorts of reactions and experiences people will have when they do a short practice like that, or even a longer one. And what's important to point out is that there is no right or wrong way to feel. People often say to me, but I can't meditate because my mind won't stop moving, talking, chattering. Well, that's what minds do. That's, in fact, what they're designed to do. We wouldn't want our minds to go blank all the time. So we don't need to have any kind of certain experience to be meditating and to be cultivating the benefits of this kind of practice. Just because you don't feel lovely at the end of it doesn't mean it hasn't been helpful to do this. As I say, in fact, it's often um, more beneficial when we practice sitting with things we don't like because it really does help us develop that capacity to be calm and steady in the face of difficulties. So if there's time when it comes to questions, um, we might get to talk about that a little bit. So just to say that from this... Um, rather simple seeming practice, all sorts of benefits can occur. So let me just introduce you to the person who um, brought it into mainstream health settings. And this is uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's Emeritus Professor of Medicine at um, Massachusetts in the States. He was the first person to formally define medita mindfulness within a kind of healthcare context and has written a very wonderful book called Full Catastrophe Living. And as you can see from that photograph, he's not wandering around in saffron robes with um, a bald shaved head or anything weird like that. Um, he just looks like a pretty regular kind of guy. I mean, he's not. He's extraordinary. But um, what's important, I think, was that John really saw the opportunity to move this into a secular setting lift it out of Buddhism, where its origins are from, and I'll tell you about that shortly, and to um, use it with people who are suffering. And what was also very sensible was that he researched this right away, so that was very kind of useful to do in a healthcare setting. But what he became interested in was using what he called mindfulness-based stress reduction in a clinic set up in the UMass Medical Center for people who had chronic pain and physical conditions that were no longer responding to Western medicine. And they were basically told to go away and learn to live with it. And of course, people had a lot of stress, anxiety, depression, and often, in fact, anger and demoralization as a result. So he put together this eight-week program that teaches yoga and meditation and a series of other exercises that help us increase mindfulness and day-to-day -day living and then using that in a very specific way to help people deal more calmly with the fact that they're living with chronic pain. So where does it come from? Well, let's say a little bit about this because there's a lot of debate about it, but in, in the terms of how we're using mindfulness within MBCT and MBSR, it very clearly comes from um, Buddhist psychology. No apology for that. And I just want to um, say something about the richness of Buddhist psychology and Buddhist philosophy. I mean, I see the Buddha, and many people do, as this person who did not wish to be worshipped as a deity, although he has been since, who was really um, the first investigator, well, not the first, but he was an investigator of the mind and noticed a whole lot of things that were incredibly helpful, I think, to the human race. I would see him as the first psychoanalyst, the first child developmental psychologist, the first cognitive therapist. Many of the things that we are rediscovering in the 20th and 21st century, you will find written about in the, the Buddhist suttas around um, 
Buddhist psychology. So what he said, and they're called the Four Noble Truths, but he really had them um, in his mind as being hypotheses to be tested, that there's suffering. Life involves suffering. It's unavoidable. But the degree to which we suffer is in our hands to some extent. The cause of suffering, he hypothesized, was due to this attachment to us having things we wait the way we want them to be all the time. You know, if we are hungry, we want to eat. If we are thirsty, we know that we need to drink. Um, that's basic life survival. But if somebody else grabs that last scone just before you got to it, then that sets up suffering. If we become very attached to the idea of having that scone with our morning tea. That's obviously a kind of trivial example, but none of us like the idea of being living in chronic pain, for example, or having a mental illness, and yet that might be your lot in life. And if you're very attached to the idea of not having that, then you're in for a lot of suffering. But he also said that he thought there was an end to suffering, that you, we could change some of the habits and behaviours that will keep that suffering going. If we keep ruminating about the fact we didn't get the scone or get angry with our neighbour who took the scone, then that will prolong the suffering of the lack of scone beyond just the lack of scone itself. Does that make sense to people? And he said that there was a path to end suffering, and this was the Eightfold Path, which um, had these components, wisdom, ethics, and mental discipline. Now, you'll see from the little asterisks that um, what John Kabat-Zinn did was lift the mindfulness and concentration aspect out of this and put it together in this MBSR program. And when that was modified in mental health settings to become mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, then the focus on skillful thought and skillful action were already, um, were also rather included. So if you think about skillful thought, you can spend a lot of time worrying about Christmas or you can just start planning for it. You can spend a lot of time giving yourself a hard time if you stuff up on something or you can just accept you've made a mistake and move on. And now th the way we work with our thinking, it's not as easy as that sometimes, but that's skillfully working with our thoughts. And similarly, if we're you know, staying at home and ruminating over something, the skillful action might be that we just get ourselves out and go and have a cup of coffee with a friend or go and do some shopping or get ourselves out of our heads a bit. So these are the kind of applications in modern day mental health, if you like. And just to um, say that, um, this is a direct quote from the Dalai Lama, that Buddhist teachings are not a religion, they're a science of mind. And this is a science that is deep and rich in wisdom and knowledge that we can really use and, um, in, our, in our modern day um, mental health and physical health care settings, I believe. Um, and certainly, um, this was something that John felt strongly about, again, that it could be learned and practiced without appealing to Oriental culture or Buddhist authority to enrich it or authenticate it. One of its strengths is that it's not dependent on any belief system or ideology. So it's accessible for anyone to try out. And that's what we find. So in our courses, we've had people of all sorts of religious denominations who have not felt that coming to an eight-week mindfulness course has in any way compromised any of their beliefs or practices. So how does it fit into mental and physical health care? Well, this is just another um, kind of a definition of mindfulness that Shauna Shapiro and her colleagues put up. But I think what's important just to, um, let me just see if I can find it. Uh, yes, this here, this bit here, intention. That the intention will change with the clinical context. That when we um, use mindfulness for people with uh, um, mental health issues, it's really to teach emotional regulation and ways of disengaging from negative thinking that, that keeps the, the depression or anxiety going. If we're using it for people with pain, then the intention is to learn how to deal more calmly with the fact that they've got chronic pain. So, And the intention means that we'll change some of the um, emphases within the course to deal with whatever um, condition our population is working with. But if we're going to roll it out in a really skillful way within mental health and physical health care settings, it's important that we look carefully at the theory and evidence base, the appropriate training of mindfulness teachers. It's not just as something as simple as reading a book and off you go. And a careful evaluation of what we do, which is why the mindfulness research group was set up. Just to say something about the evidence and the fact that John was, was wise enough to start researching mindfulness when he started introducing it into this um, medical centre. So I was subject to a number of randomised control trials that were then looked at in this big meta-analysis. And really the take-home message from this, as you can see in yellow, what's highlighted is the, the physical conditions that were being um, particularly targeted, but it was also used in other settings as well, and I'll talk about them a bit later on. 
But that what was um, concluded was that there was certainly room for cautious optimism. It wasn't just a fad or a phase. There seemed to be some scientific evidence showing that it was pretty robust. But what was even more interesting, well, to the mental health workers anyway, was the fact that it seemed to be particularly helpful for you might, what you might call access one conditions. Depression, anxiety, emotional reactions seemed to do particularly well with this approach. So how does it then translate across into mental health care settings? So you could look at it that generally um, mental health issues are suffering, just as the Buddha said in his first noble truth that we are all suffering in some way or other and um, suffering is suffering no matter what you call it. Um, but if we look at what's coming out in um, some of the, the recent cognitive psychology and mental health research, um, then I think it just informs and helps us apply mindfulness more skillfully. So this is something that maybe all of us have experienced at some time. This is called the exhaustion funnel that Marie Asberg from Sweden, um, it's her, or her work. And what she says that when we get overwhelmed, um, life tends to narrow down. You may have noticed this. When you're really working very hard or you've had a lot of really difficult um, cases or clients to work with, that you feel you're getting nowhere, that things are going wrong in your personal life as well, and that suddenly you're just at that stage where you feel completely exhausted. People all kind of have a bit of a sense of that various times. It's not uncommon for us to have this at some point in our careers. And it's not ab abnormal and it's not something to get freaked out about. But it is something to be aware of and not deny and to learn ways of looking after yourself around it. Because what happens just as the funnel is narrowing down is that our behavioural repertoire narrows. So what happens is that we keep on working, we keep on going to work, we keep paying the bills because we have to, um, we keep you know, looking after the kids and feeding them and taking them to school. But the things that start to drop out of our behavioural repertoire are all those wonderful, nourishing, restorative things that actually give us energy and give us some sense of joy in life. <clears throat> our thinking becomes less spacious. Me. It feels like our minds are full of all of these thoughts and there's not that space to see or notice or think about other things in a different, more adaptive way. Our emotional responses restrict. We tend to get, we're a bit kind of edgy and irritable and, and maybe even a bit jaded and cynical so that our whole range of our emotional repertoire narrows and the sense in our body is of tightness and tension and narrowing down as well. Everything tenses up because we're in a state of chronic stress. And for some people, that will really lead to a burnout syndrome that makes it very hard to function. Often what's needed is a really good holiday where you do not take any mobile phones or computers or laptops or any of that business with you. I did this recently. When we went to Bali, we couldn't um, take any of that stuff. We couldn't get reception. And I can tell you it was the best holiday I've had because I didn't look at a single email for 10 days. That just did me so much good, I can't tell you. Um, Emails have their place, but not on holidays. Even my kids managed to do without Facebook for a whole 10 days, and they were much nicer individuals for that, I would, I would say. But what are some of the more specific things that happen when um, depression and stress really kind of kicks in? And that is that discrepancy monitor. We are starting to become hypervigilant for things going wrong. And you've had a bad day, and the next day you come into work, right, what's going to go wrong today? And you're kind of looking for it. Um, and you sort of deny or you don't see the things that are going all right. Or sometimes people with depression will be so frightened that depression's coming back, or psychosis or any recurrent condition, that they'll deny it's there and they'll ignore those early warning signs. So that can be problematic. The next thing that can occur is that our selection bias, our, our way of thinking changes, that it becomes filled with more negative thinking. When we're under stress, we all know this, we tend to see... The negative, we tend to jump to negative conclusions. And if you've had episodes of depression before, that process will happen much more automatically and readily. It's not whinging, it's not deliberate, it's not somebody being a victim. It's just what happens automatically. Against their will, if you like. And then there's this whole process of rumination where we get caught in thinking. We've got a problem and we go round and round and round in our minds trying to figure it out. You all had that experience at some time where you just can't stop thinking about something? And you think that the longer you think about it, suddenly the, the whole magical solution is going to appear. But in fact, what the research shows is that the more you think and ruminate about something, the less problem-solving um, 
efficacy there is. Like, there's been studies that show that. Um, it just actually affects our ability to think clearly and well. And finally, there's the good old experiential avoidance. None of us like to feel horrible. So the kind of things we do that are maladaptive, we would all be doing them, I'm quite sure, unless you're all enlightened. And that is that we tend to drink too much, we tend to eat too much chocolate, uh, we tend to go shopping. Girls go to clothes shops, boys go to gadget shops. And I'm not just overgeneralizing here. These are the, this is the feedback I get from workshops all the time. So these are some of the things we do. Or we might make ourselves extremely busy or try and distract ourselves from what's going on. And of course, all that does is make us more exhausted. So we get this kind of sucked into this kind of space so that you know we, there's some stress or some symptoms coming back. We start to notice things aren't right and either panic or go into denial. But we'll become preoccupied so that people will call our name several times. I'm thinking about my kids calling. In fact, they say, Mom, Mom, Mora, and that always gets my attention. And they say, I hate it when you're not paying attention. I was like, yep, it's so easy, isn't it, to get caught up in our minds. So we get caught in that chatter, but the trouble is if we're stressed or we've been depressed before, then that preoccupation will quickly fill up with negative thinking, negative content, and rumination processes. So we get into these old, unhelpful habits. These were the habits that the Buddha was talking about that are not helpful, that we need to find ways to change because they keep us um, stuck in this vicious cycle of depression, anxiety, stress. Once you're there, it's pretty hard to get out. So we want to find ways of um, uh, getting um, some approaches put in earlier up that chain before it cascades down into depression. So this is where mindfulness-based cognitive therapy came in. It was developed out of MBSR. It's about 90% the same as MBSR. But the focus is much more around dealing with processes of thinking. So rather than challenging the content or retelling the story or hearing the story, it's more about, ah, there I go again, ruminating. There I go again, thinking negatively. Right, back to the breath, back to this present moment now. No need to stay there. No value often in staying there. So learning to disengage, which trains up a certain kind of cognitive flexibility in our minds, um, but also learning this attitude of being um, kind of gentle and curious and um, more accepting of what's going on, which, of course, is much easier to say than do which is why it's an eight-week intensive immersion in meditation. It's not something that is going to turn around with a couple of brief mindfulness exercises, unfortunately. So the format that we run in our centre, in many centres, is we have a session with people before the group to really assess and prepare them for what's going to be involved. We have eight classes with um, up to 12 participants, partly because that's just the size of the room that we've got. And that just says a little bit about what's in there, very similar to MBSR, but with a focus on using mindfulness and different behavioural exercises to um, manage depression and anxiety states. And people are asked to meditate every day for the eight-week course, um, up to 40 minutes a day. It's like if you've been really unfit and not looking after your body, you don't go to the gym and go once a week for five minutes. Now, what happens then? Not very much. It's a bit like that. You have to really put the work in for a period of time for things to shift and change. That's the bad news. Nothing good comes out of no hard work, and we have to put some work in. But we're very gentle and encouraging around that. And then we have a follow-up session afterwards just to see how people have got on, um, whether it's helped, how they can keep their practice going. We run booster classes at CTAD four times a year. Um, and, and, or if they need other kind of intervention, if that's become clear that there's something else that's needed, then we would put that in. So in some ways, the difference between CBT and, to a certain extent, acceptance and commitment therapy is that there's a clear change agenda. It's a therapy designed to make changes in symptoms. MBCT is about teaching people how to accept, be with, investigate their experience so that they can start over time to use um, actions and ways of thinking or working with their minds that um, will help them change over time in a way that's actually sustainable. And it's important just to point out, therefore, that it's not indicated in acute situations or for certain conditions. Like, there are certain conditions that are going to respond much better to the evidence-based treatments we already had. Mindfulness is not a panacea. And it's, that's part of the reason why we assess people beforehand, just to make sure it's the right thing for them at this point in their, their therapeutic journey, if you like. So just to say, if people are interested in looking at the more recent meta-analyses where they've gathered all the studies together and looked at what's happening, that again, these are showing that this, the findings are very positive, so the references are there. 
Um, but just to say a little bit about what's happened in depression, when they put this into place, what actually happened? Well, you'll see from the... Um, this is mindfulness added to treatment as usual compared to people just having treatment as usual for their depression and then following them up at one year. And what they found was that people with three or more episodes, if you added a mindfulness intervention, at more than half the relapse rate compared to treatment as usual. So it was doing what they had hoped it would do. And just to say that Grey Meadows in, in Melbourne has just finished a big study in the Australian context just to see whether it's helping. And the preliminary data is looking very promising. So the, when I told you at the beginning that I started using it in people with treatment-resistant depression um, because it had been really uh, designed as a relapse prevention for people who had already recovered, but I could see that it might be helpful for people who are very stuck in that ruminative, ruminative and avoidant kind of way of being, and so started using it there and collected the data, and this is what we found. Oops, I'll just go back. So... Um, very pleased to see there was a big reduction after this is at the end of the eight-week course big reduction in depression symptoms and then we sent the questionnaire out that people had were maybe anywhere between two and four years out from the course and we're very pleased to see that those effects lasted there was a slight drift upwards but still a significant reduction from before they came to what was happening up to two to four years later very exciting um, and then Kate Matthews, one of our um, master's students at CTAD, who now works in public mental health as a psychologist, um, looked to see whether they were getting the same things in a public mental health setting, because that first study was in a private practice setting. Would we still see the same results in Western mental health, where the demographics are um, more challenging, where there's a lot more comorbidity and a lot more difficulties in these people's lives? And we were delighted to find that there too, the full effects lasted for up to two years, depression um, score is still in the normal range of those people who returned the questionnaires, um, which was a significant percentage, so we're reasonably happy with our results. Um, but what was interesting was that their well-being correlated with attendance at booster sessions, keeping their mindfulness practice going. Um, these were the important things. And it also correlated with an increase in their mindful awareness, as measured by questionnaires, and reduced rumination scores. Now, what I don't have here, but what I just wanted to also let you know was that the big study that was done in the UK, where they did a similar um, um, study in primary care, when they looked to see what measures, what things would predict people having lower depression scores um, 15 months after the group had finished, what they found in their study was that it was a rise in self-compassion that predicted lower um, depression scores. So this is something that we don't even explicitly teach beyond this emphasis of be gentle with your experience, be interested in what's happening, be gentle with yourself, be curious as to why you haven't done any practice this week. What got in the way? If you take the judgment out, what was it that you've learned that actually stops you looking after yourself? So we have those kind of messages going on, and that has um, caused a rise in self-compassion, which is wonderful, because many people with depression have a very harsh, self-critical way of being with themselves but it also seemed to predict uh, a reduction in depression, which in some ways, of course, makes complete sense. So if we just look at this slide, all it's telling us is that there's been an explosion of interest in mindfulness um, ever since this work began. These are all the studies that have been published. So um, that's very exciting, and there's lots of funding in the US around for it. A bit harder to get it here, but that's okay. I'm just very non-judgmentally accepting of that right now. <laughs> Mostly, but not always. <laughs> However, um, it's not difficult to collect data and it's not difficult to do some um, analyses if you've got um, friends in the right places. And um, lots of people will help out with this kind of work, which is fantastic. So I just wanted to show you what happens when I started running the mindfulness groups for professionals, for people who are working in the health arena who were interested in learning to do it, um, do the course so that they could teach it to other people because it's the first foundational part, the training, but also because, as everyone said, I need this for me. I want to look after me better. So what we did was um, they came through the eight-week course. We collected DASAs, that's the Depression Anxiety Stress sc um, sc uh, Scale, before and after, and found, again, a very significant um, and pleasing reduction in stress and anxiety scores. Not much change in depression because, fortunately, not too many people were severely depressed when they came. So they'd done it as a real act of self-care as a prevention against getting to the burnout stage. Um, and this is just to say that there's now, you know, 
mindfulness is now spreading everywhere, just like that slide showed with all of the, the rise in research publications that are going on, used in depression, generalised anxiety disor disorder, eating disorders, very helpful in um, compensatory overeating, um, not been tried with anorexia yet. Um, used as part of DBT, dialectical behaviour therapy for borderline personality disorder complex trauma and I would say that when people have got those conditions starting off with DBT is a much wiser way to go. Referring straight into MBCT with its fairly intensive rigorous kind of approach to daily meditation can be um, just too much um, for people if they've had no other mindfulness training or therapy. So we generally steer people in that direction first. Um, it's been tested in the UK in psychosis and the chronic mentally ill and as we know there's a growing evidence base for acceptance and commitment therapy and there's the research growing for its um, use in the workplace. So just to say that what's really important is that we have to be um, wise in um, rolling this out because um, it's been very clear to me from both my own personal experience and training other people and being trained by very experienced therapists, uh, mindfulness teachers, is that we need to have a very strong grounding in mindfulness practice ourselves. Otherwise, it's like trying to teach someone to swim when you can't swim yourself and you don't know how to do it and you're a bit unsure about it. It just doesn't, it just doesn't come through. It's really important to teach from that authentic and hopefully embodied place where you really know this work inside out. You know its joys, you know its difficulties, you know the obstacles that will arise, and you can really teach from that knowledge and experience. It's important that in the classroom, in, this, in the class every week, that you're embodying mindfulness, that you're not getting cross with folks that haven't done their homework, or that you're dismissive or um, judgmental in your, your tone or your interactions, that you're trying to model a certain way of being that hopefully is just coming out of your own practice so that people can see what's possible, how it's possible to be with their own inner world. That um, it's important to have experience of working with the condition or the context that you're going to apply mindfulness to. Um, that you actually, if you're working with... Um, you want to use it for psychosis, that you've worked with people for, with psychosis for a long time, that you know when to use mindfulness and when not, that you know when to refer on, to readmit, to treat with medication and when to use mindfulness. Likewise with depression, um, likewise with a whole lot of anxiety disorders. People sometimes refer folks in to us for treatment of panic disorder with MBCT. It's not the treatment of choice for panic disorder. Standard CBT is much more effective and aimed at panic disorder. So it's important that you know the field you're working in so you can make the right call about this. And if you're going to be teaching MBCT, then obviously you have to have a working knowledge of CBT because it's a very strong part of it. And that you've had appropriate training so that we say you do the eight-week mindfulness course. Um, we recommend probably that you come on the residential trainings that are around the country to really learn how to teach the meditation to one another and get supervision on that. And, um, and then to have supervision on um, your first couple of courses if you're not co-teaching with an experienced teacher. And it's really helpful to have experience of leading groups because many people say to us, this is so different from doing individual therapy. Managing a whole room full of people is very different from the one-on-one -on -one kind of work. So although that sounds like a long list, um, experience has taught me that it's much better to be clear and upfront at the beginning so that people know this is not just a quick fix and a quick new snappy technique to use. Um, it has a lot of depth and substance to it and it's important to really know that so that you can teach wisely and well. We after all wouldn't want a heart surgeon who's done a weekend workshop on cardiac transplants to be mucking about with our hearts, would we? And yet we are working with people's hearts and minds in this work and it's important we know what we're doing. So I just want to finish this presentation with um, a quote that um, I love from a colleague in Melbourne called Bob Sharples, who's written a book called Meditation, Calming the Mind. And you, can, um, you might want to sit with your eyes closed and really allow these words to sink in. He says, don't meditate to fix yourself, to heal yourself, to improve yourself, to redeem yourself. Rather, do it as an act of love, of deep, warm friendship to yourself. In this way, there is no longer any need for the subtle aggression of self-improvement. 
for the endless guilt of not doing enough. It offers the possibility of an end to the ceaseless round of trying so hard that wraps so many of our lives in a knot. Instead, there is now meditation as an act of love. How endlessly delightful and encouraging. So I'll leave that up there for now. And I'd just like to say thank you for having me. Keep breathing. And I think we've got time for some questions. Yes. Thank you so much for that, Mara. It was really wonderful. And I think we're all starting to think more about mindfulness. And in the work that we do, as you said, in the first instance, it's becoming more and more important for us to be mindful (laughs) ourselves. I was just interested in the evidence around mindfulness with uh, chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence yet to suggest that it actually is effective? Yes. Yes, there is. So in that um, meta-analysis by Ruth Baer, she talks about some of the studies that John and his group did, John Kabat-Zinn did on chronic pain. And what they found at the end of the eight-week course was that there was a um, 75% of people had noted a moderate to um, high level of reduction in their chronic pain. So the actual experience of pain had changed, as well as a reduction in the anxiety, stress, depression that it caused. When they followed those people up four years later, 90% of them were still meditating in some shape or form, which was really fantastic. But what was interesting was that some, their pain scores would often start to creep back up again, but their emotional reaction to it stayed mindful. So even though the pain, which is a kind of habit of almost the mind, the body, the nervous system in some ways, it's, it's very hard to turn that off once it's been there a long time. But the way they were dealing with it was now much better. But fascinating in that time, in that eight-week course, that there was a reduction in pain. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Yep. Um, Just uh, in regards to mindfulness in a drug and alcohol setting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So there's a guy called Alan Marlott um, who developed a program called Mindfulness-Based Relapse Prevention. And they've published quite a bit of stuff around that. My understanding is that um, there's certainly people in, in Australia who are training in that, have trained in that. And I know that the, is it the Woolshed down at Victor, the in residential place? My understanding is that their program is based on those principles of mindfulness-based relapse prevention. With the idea, like, I mean, having the mindfulness practice just helps you regulate yourself more anyway and deal with maybe the depression and stress that got people into abusing substances in the first place. But also learning to urge surf, that rise and kind of desire to drink or take something and watching it like with curiosity, it's getting higher, it's higher, it's higher. And breathing and breathing and oh, oh, it's subsiding. So they're taught to urge surf as part of that program. It's really worth following up. Alan Marlat is the is the person who developed it. <laughs> Thank you, Maura. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you've had um, significant differences in um, treatment outcomes um, in the reduction, I guess, of the outcome measures at pre and post. Have you had, has mindfulness, the treatment, the eight-week treatment, been compared against another treatment group to control for those non-specific treatment Uh effects over the eight weeks? Yeah, it's a good question. Because it's still early days, all the early studies have been around, does it help? Um, And how is it helping? And now um, it's the time for people to start doing these studies where they compare against other treatments and seeing if it's better than. I suppose what they have been compared to an active treatment was treatment as usual in the early studies. So people had their usual treatment, they were treated for depression, they would see the psychiatrist or their doctor, they have their medication or their CBT or whatever their normal treatment was. So it was actually being compared to an active treatment as opposed to no treatment. So that's important to say. But it will be interesting, like one of the big studies we're all waiting to um, find out the results for is one in Oxford, Mark Williams' last big grant. Um, And what he's done, uh, what they've done there is that they've compared the eight-week mindfulness course for depression um, against the same course but with no meditation in it at all. 
So the same ideas, but no, med no formal practice, either in the class or out of the class, to see whether it is the actual practice that's making the difference. So we're starting to sort of do those dismantling studies that will tell us a bit more about what's going on. Right. Oh, got one more. Have we got time for one more or not? Sorry. Right. Uh, thank you very much, but I found that really, really fascinating. It drew me back to a lot of things from years ago. Yeah. Um, around existential therapy, Buddhist therapy, and so on. The thing that troubles me uh, often in the mental health world is, uh, is, is the tension between symptom management mm -hmm. and Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I think it's a good question. I don't think, think we know the answer to that. Some of my colleagues are interested in using mindfulness in acute inpatient settings to see whether it helps, even just sow the seeds of what might be possible for something they'll take up later on. Um, there is a tension between, um, you know, trying to deal with the acute situation and then um, looking at things that need to be done later on. We're really interested in this idea of sequencing. When does a particular intervention have the best chance of taking hold in a patient's journey or a client's journey, if you like? And I think that's a bit we haven't really got fully to grips with. We tend to have a bit of a smorgasbord effect and hope that something will work. I think we need to think about that a bit more carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. That was, uh, that was fantastic. And um, I could have kept my eyes closed for a little bit longer, I think, there. And <laughs> it's very good to um, hear about mindfulness in its um, you know, true form, I guess, because you're right, the word is very bandied around. So it's, uh, it was a great presentation. So could you join me in thanking Maura for that?